this week on Hermitcraft. But more importantly, is the moon big? Is it? Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap. My name is Pixorifs, our writer is LoyXP, and if you've got your ear to the ground, you'll have noticed the rumblings of a big old Minecraft update. These aren't the only rumblings we've heard on the Hermitcraft server lately, but more on that later. What's baking our noodles lately is what the Hermits are going to do now 1.18 is almost here, promising to bring more caves, more cliffs, and 64 blocks in the upwards and downwards directions for the Hermits to play with. We're pretty sure the bottom hole is getting an upgrade, or is that a downgrade? But with many of the Hermits bringing their megabase projects to a satisfying level of completion, we're getting hints that the new update might bring reasons to step outside the continent they've settled on so far. One thing's for sure, if they need to sail to find the new world, they've got enough boats to do that now. So let's pull up the gangplank, set a course, and full sail into the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Starting with Azumavoid, who has now informed his evil friend of the Employee of the Month program and suffered the consequences. Rewards? Are you mad? Make them work harder for free, fighting for some worthless prize. If you think that's bad, just wait till he finds out that it's Evil X that's the prize in the competition. In the interest of the Empire, Azuma goes on a stealth world tour to spread around the advertisement and map pamphlets for the Evil Emporium, and here's hoping the folks really will pay them a visit given that the area is nearly feature complete, and the Alpen village nearby is close to being finished as well. This might just be our most profitable week ever here on the server. Though the storage tower at it won't be done unless the storage compartment is decorated and incorporated, which X makes a point of doing, along with some minor tweaks and fixes around the farming apparati. Anyhow, his ad bombing of the competition works out pretty well, though he's clearly not the first one to try, and why are there all these boats everywhere? Doc's just probably up to his usual shenanigans, right? Now as far as strangers popping up at her base, Zombie Cleo has a very eventful episode between a vintage beef insta-porting in Yeah, no, no, I, I, I see that, that's, that's also terrifying Jevin showing up with door-to-door -door shulker box gambling Go okay. ahead and take a look at your treasures, perfect oh, Number wrong. four <laughs> And of course Corralis responding to the personal training ad posted with the Hive Drake commercials Increase my muscle mass and though the body he's interested in building turns out to be his own, and not the plenty of armor stands available. Even so, Cleo provides him and his Squid Game jumpsuit with a crash course in Minecraft movement of all kinds, from obstacle avoidance and advanced parkour exercise to elytra dogfight skills and air acrobatics. Unfortunately, no amount of weightlifting makes him strong enough to resist gambling at the derp coin. Kerales have a Snickers. Better? Much better. Now combat ready, Keralis has to battle the sudden lag of the Big Eyes base conglomerate caused by an array of boats just popping in out of nowhere. They came by sea, I guess. The obvious play here is to come back at them with a bigger boat, put a pin in that, so Keralis protects his land from future seaside invasion with a warship from the world of them, ready to pretend bombard whatever flotilla approaches the luxury island. Including property lawyers, I suppose, seeing as how Grian still owns his entire attic he bought back at the beginning of the season. Anyway, D5. <laughs> My private little, like, gunboat outside, outside the house. I love this. So in gambling on derp coin, Wells Knight buys out a whole bunch as well, being one of the core gang and all. And in the personal luxury islands, Wells is seen putting some work in the floating chunk of futuristic rock that he has for a base. And by in, we mean literally inside it, the infrastructure here being a cross tunnel to the middle of it from the outer gravity ring. Uh, so now what I need to do is figure out kind of this middle room. So we're going to be moving our nether portal up to in here, and that will be kind of the center piece of this room. The design continues even in the nether, where Wells connects his base to the nether hub proper and makes sure the basalt tunnel is presentable for any possible visitors. So there's that tunnel. I am completely out of inventory space. But while we're on the topic of floating islands, False Symmetry finally moves into her one, carried by a giant eagle. Although another section of the woods is cleared out downstairs and another mushroom cottage is put in its place, False affixes a hut to the soaring landmass too. The terrain is turned to a more picturesque form, and the whole ensemble is off to have a mid-air fight with the gorilla's windmill island. That was my problem, I, I wanted to build something tall on here, but it was just going to be 
too close to the eagle. It wasn't going to look right. But no, it now has stuff. I'm so excited. Another sizable beast makes an appearance at Cubfan 135's base canyon. Or rather, its giant skeleton does. The entire season has built up to this moment. Psych, it's actually the episode where we're going to make the desert. Cub's mega crocodile ornament inhabits the more deserty land of the custom biome, which now reaches out and transitions to a much more lush oasis-like shore of the river that runs around the edge of it. So again, the idea is that there is a lichen fungus that is basically causing the canyon to come into existence. Only small life forms, which require a little bit of water, are surviving in this environment. As for the living flora and fauna, there's a notorious cameo by the Love Tropics segment Cubfan did, where the viewers and participants of the charity livestream had their names immortalized on this season's world. The donation heroes from the Love Tropics stream had their shoutouts on the plethora of custom mangroves in the wetlands across the canyon though maybe the skeleton is actually normal size and it's the rest of the server that's tiny. After all, Cub over here fits easily in the gap under a minecart. Let's take a look. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what happened. I think I was flying and then clicked this, uh, this minecart here where we're... So about Fantastic Beasts, meet Gem's latest, Moose 2, Cow. It's a great cow. Oh, it's a little angry. But it's a great cow. The riveting Ravager resides rightfully in the restricted ruminant radius, which complicates the access to leather a bunch, but here's hoping whatever finishing touches Gemini Tay has planned for the base won't be too bovious. I've been loving the challenge that this large base has created so far. I've never really done anything like this in survival mode. And Lucky then that the Cottagecore Palace and its delightful moss roof seemingly meet their end this week, and it's certainly a good ending though the shader vision for sure exposes not just how pretty the land has become, but also the many multicolored wireframes the base still has for planned builds. So here's hoping we haven't seen the last of this neck of the woods. A-OK. -okay. But I'm calling it finished because I've done all of the ideas that I personally had when I started out this season. And I started out this season trying desperately not to overwhelm myself with builds. We certainly haven't seen the last of Jem's Halloween adventure. Now Zedaf has unearthed the Frankenstein monster she and Pearl left at his doorstep. There's a sign over here. Oh my goodness, hello, You're, you have a nose. Being a criminal against nature in his own right, Zed of course adopts the man-creature, though only after it's OSHA compliant. After all, if the general Frankenstein methods are to be believed, those are several union workers stitched together. Anyway, let's work on the villager tower. Anyhow, Zedaf has his own science children to take care of, and luckily the building they're in already does that, kind of. After Zed reconstitutes the villager dating rig, it only takes a couple of logistical challenges to drive the whole condition tower to its finished state. Eh, eh, don't watch this bit. This bit's not going in the montage, okay, we can't- I To remind you, the lab was meant to guide a fresh recruit from birth to a growing centrifuge to a job assignment room, and finally into Zed's trading hall. <gasps> oh my goodness, I've just been waiting here for like three minutes, and he finally did it! He walked in, okay. It still treats the employees better than the Botum Juggler Mumbo made, which luckily has not seen much use this week. Against all odds and procedures, Grian leads Impulse and Pearl into the new advertisement strategy without first throwing any of them into the void. But don't worry, the blackness under the world sure got fed this week, and more on that later. This is in-your-face marketing, this is. Oh, I love it. The logic the Botum Bunch came up with was simple. Create more lag at other shopping hotspots so the 20 frames people get at the G-Train adjacent territory feel bearable by comparison. Somewhere in the pipeline, however, the idea to fry the server on their way there surely got into the mix, and the method by which they lag the Big Ice Shore and the Octagon turned out to be a several hundred number of boats, all summoned into a single space because dispensers basically treat boats like spawn eggs. How is Botum oh, laggier than this enormous <laughs> pile of boats? I right, don't. more boats. Oh, 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 oh. A fun added bonus is that when nudged, the vessel pops into a fountain of entities and gracefully douses the land in an even layer of plank potentially entity cramming whoever dared touch it to death in the process. Tango, we've only got two minutes of invis left, come on. <laughs> We're running out of potions here. <laughs> oh, oh, it's just 800 boats? I'm dying! I'm dying! I'm dying! I'm dying! To their credit, there's also an attempt to lag bust their own area, but the server might be too on fire for that by the time they get there. The masses are confused by the whole ordeal while the store owners plan their revenge. Tango Tech for one decides to do unto Botum like they already do unto themselves, and comes up with a devious plan to plug their treasured hole, but not really. Already having data packed a tree hat into the mix, he now rigs an item to render as a full block of bedrock when placed into an item frame. 
The trick allows him to mask any block to look like bedrock, which is how Pearl's own house is filled with bedrock-looking obsidian that's just about tough enough to mine to be believable. <laughs> you brought this on yourself, Pearl! How is this possible? I can't get so much... What? This is legitimately bedrock, guys. Like, I, I can't mine this. Wait. What? Wait, what? Oh, what? What? But the trick is that the humble item frame can be put on things players go through too. So the hole in the bedrock Impulse spent so much time blowing out appears to be regenerated back in. Keyword being appears to be. Oh yeah, I mean it's real. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, oh. ah! <laughs> That's what you get! What is he doing? What, 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 what are you doing? What are you doing? Tango! Tango! <laughs> what are you doing? Impulse is the guinea pig for Tango's bedrock shenanigans, and he falls for it, quite literally. But he's no stranger to flinging things around, which is part of the plan for his factory. His cactus farm output gets a more kinetic approach with water streams and slime block launchers, eventually dunking it into hidden hoppers on various sides of the room. Kind of going all around in tunnels and tubes and spitting out and launching all over the place and really giving some animation to this place. The Candyman can, and indeed he does, since we've just had Halloween and Christmas is on the way, so he makes sure to restock his store. After participating in the lagging out of not one, but two different regions of the server, Impulse promises to clear up lag around Botum by covering hoppers, insta-killing zombies, and even cleaning up after Mumbo a bit. Oh, and there it comes! Whoop, whoop. It's a task that goes hand in hand with Pearlescent Moon challenging him to clean up the remaining Moonkins in exchange for his missing redstone box, which it turns out was already kinda delivered to him. I actually had my hat in here. As you may notice, I'm not wearing my hat because it was in my... You have my hat! <laughs> Pearl! You're looking for this thing? Pearl! The true test of Tango's retribution arrives when Mumbo notices the bedrock, and seeing it apparently blocking the bottom hole again, immediately dives through it. It's no longer. Oh! 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 Then, having recovered from near disaster, invites Grian to go for a dip as well. Oh! Oh, I Wait, fell in I again! Oh, oh. Oh, I've fallen in twice! Mumbo, die! <laughs> <laughs> Grian! Where does. Where does it end? <laughs> One good prank deserves another, which is when the group decides they're gonna need a bigger boat. Together they harvest a phenomenal amount of wood, and even have to supplement that with some purchases at the Octagon Log Shop, all so they can build a massive upturned boat over the Big Eyes Town. The inside boasts a glowstone sign inviting people to buy at Botum, despite which it casts a big enough shadow to turn the Big Eyes Crew's shopping district into a casual, hostile mob farm. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Gratis is actually online, so I thought I'd just inform him that it's it's kind of difficult to shop in the Big Eye Shopping District at this point in time. Meanwhile, Mumbo seems to have taken the phrase you are what you eat a bit too literally, because after a single bite of Grian's merchandise, he becomes a golden carrot. And if you think that's weird, wait until he eats a pork chop. In this new form, he builds some door-to-door -door pathways connecting his mountain houses, and a rope bridge that can't quite shake the happy feeling. But realising he'd better come up with a way of changing back into a real boy, he invites Grian to critique his trees and unknowingly sign his soul away. It does mention harvesting of souls, so that I could potentially become a human again? When the shenanigans come knocking on Pearlescent Moon's door, she's fresh from having lost all her gear to the lag zombies, so it's no surprise that apparently being bedrocked out of her storage system hits pretty hard but she susses out the situation after some experimental mining, and it's probably because she had her thinking cap on. I, I don't even know. That's absolutely fantastic. Flipping the concept of a bucket hat on its head, Pearl's specialised hat-o-matic creation has its own llama, and thanks to the musical stylings of John O'Smithers, has its own music video as well. Make our own Paloma coat, sit in any deadly boat, dress us all in golden gowns, turn the city upside down, I'll go. B00 finds the Big Eyes boat bamboozle and wonders if there's just been an influx of tourism, especially now he's been prettifying the area with crop fields and farmhouses. But alas, they are still in need of more customers, and B-Dubs has his big eyes set on Etho. Invoicing Etho for the sugarcane farm he recently built him, the charge is simply to shop at the Big Eyes shopping district more frequently. That's made a little harder by the shadow the big boat casts over the area, and when Tango doesn't react as intensely as he expected, B-Dubs takes matters into his own hands. 
Between designing another beautified redstone farm, this time for Moss, he tries TNTing the boat, but eventually just turns it into Swiss cheese and stuffs all the smaller boats into shulker boxes to sell to Etho, next to a shop which sells TNT for, you know, no reason. Holes to let light through, and we've got enough to wear. No more bad guys gonna spawn, which is great. TFC had better get as much branch mining done as he can, because sooner or later he'll be running into new world generation, and with a deeper cavern layer and broader ore distribution, he won't be finding all the materials he's used to. Yeah, and what I really need to do is go ahead and do the work, move this thing down another 25 blocks, because I think I'm about there. Whether he plans to adapt his strategy remains to be seen, but at least he's happier with the decor now. Thanks to some ideas from Reddit and his continued curiosity for new additions, he has copper candlesticks lining the tunnels now, alongside the redstone-powered railway leading deeper into the mineshaft. I am gonna go ahead and call this pretty much good enough. I'm gonna... no. I'm not. I'm not giving up. <laughs> While others are casting shadows around the server, Doc M's Shadow Dome has been getting a bit of attention. It's not quite in the money-making stage yet, but as he and Rendog declare this infrastructure week, he works on roads and paths around the dome itself, leading to a moon-like landscape, crystal architecture, and iJev in offering Doc mystery shulkers to splat his face into it. So I really, really like this building that you have here. No. But while Doc works on the basement, suddenly a Rendog appears to inform him they've been bottomed. It's moving! Bro, it's alive! It? It's like a I living feel... entity! The pair returns to Octagon to find it covered in an amorphous mass of boats, a lag bomb which they now find themselves needing to clear up for the sake of future profits. Wait, is that an answer to your billboard you built right in their face? Oh, maybe! It's enough to make Rendog consider moving to the country, although he's planning to make the countryside part of the Octagon itself. He devotes himself to planning a gothic town amid golden wheat fields, all under the watchful eye of their supercharged lightning conductor. Despite all that power being at their fingertips, the old ways are sometimes the best, and Ren starts with a windmill to grind all that wheat. In the meantime, it looks like Doc hasn't reacted well to the boat prank. But that's all an imaginary scenario conducted in a single-player world, and in reality, Doc has put his hive mind to work on resolving Botum's lag issues through some lightly modded intervention. He's building bridges in other ways too, as another giant spider walker is deployed to hold up a high-tech bridge between Octagon's various islands. There's a gold farm in the works too, and in case gold isn't valuable enough, he stakes more derp coin and negotiates with Azuma for the installation of a derp coin ATM at the Octagon shop. It's at this point he hears a distant, ominous rumbling and notices the moon is bigger. On further investigation, it has been growing slowly over the course of a couple of weeks, which leaves us with the question, when the moon eventually hits the server like a big pizza pie, is that a moray? And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is LoyXP and my name is PixelRiffs. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.